So officially welcome everyone to this special Winter Solstice Nature Journal Writing Workshop Wednesday. And welcome if you're watching on the recording. So we're just waiting a minute to let people come in and sharing some of our favorite holiday traditions. So one tradition is cooking pumpkin at least once, once a week. I think you meant to say in the fall and winter, um, on the winter solstice, lighting every candle in the house. That sounds really cozy. Hosting Christmas Eve dinner and sitting around the table together. And making sun bread. I'm not sure what that is, but it sounds good. <laughs> Lighting the Hanukkah candles each of the eight nights. Oh, me too. I, I actually get to celebrate Christmas and Hanukkah because we have both in my family. So the Hanukkah candles is one of my favorite too. And I love how every night it just gets brighter and brighter and brighter. <clears throat> Lighting, oh, and a book about the sun bread. Oh, Lighting the candles the four Sundays before Christmas and baking bread with dried fruits called um, Hutzelbrook, if I'm getting that right. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> celebrating the darkness on the solstice, celebrating the Kwanzaa. All right, if you're still typing, uh, try to finish up and we'll really get started. So again, as most of you know, um, in the Nature Journal community, our only rule here is to be kind to each other. So this is um, a, just always like to remind everyone, this is a supportive, non-judgmental space everyone can feel free to express themselves and share or not share if you like. Um, but it's all about our own exploration, not about being better than anybody else. <clears throat> so, so happy Hanukkah, happy winter solstice, happy Yule, Merry Christmas, happy Kwanzaa. I don't know if I forgot anything, but um, Happy New Year, I guess. I probably won't see most of you till the New Year. Oh, and just before we get started, today's class is free, but if you're able to make a donation of any amount, it's greatly appreciated. That helps us to um, continue to provide these free classes for our community. So I'm going to put that link in the chat if you would like. I do also have Venmo. Um, I can get you that in a, I'll, I'll get you that in a little bit. I need to get my um, Venmo address. Um, also, I'm sharing today about the American Chestnut Project and I'm not affiliated with them, but if you'd like to support their efforts, they also take donations to help restore the chestnut tree. So I'm putting that in the chat too. Now, um, you know, let me get the Venmo before I forget, because I'm probably going to forget, in case that's easier to anybody. It's actually better for me if you are able to do Venmo, because PayPal um, takes about 3% for fees, but with Venmo, I get to keep all of your donation. So, here is my Venmo, I'm putting that in the chat. Okay. Now that we've got all that out of the way, can everybody still see the screen? Okay, perfect.
So I actually thought of this, doing this workshop at um, a couple of weeks ago, I was at my grandparents' house and they had a thing of chestnuts from the grocery store. It was in some styrofoam, plastic wrap. And it just reminded me that, <clears throat> um, and I also remind, think of it um, with that song, Chestnuts Roasting on an Open Fire, which is where I borrowed for the title of today's workshop. Um, but it, I saw those chestnuts at my grandparents' house and it reminded me, that, oh, these are probably from your Euro um, European chestnuts from Europe because we don't really have American chestnuts anymore. And so I'm just dreaming of some day in the future when we will be able to have the American chestnuts. So this is some of the story of the American chestnut. So <clears throat> the American chestnut used to be called the Redwood of the East. And it was a really important tree in our forests. Um, back then, about one in every four trees, or about 25% of the forest, was American chestnut. As you can see from this picture how big they could get. And this is what the leaves look like. You can see they're, they look similar to beech leaves, but the tooths on the leaves are a little bit tooth teeth. The leaves are a little bit more spiky. And of course, these are the chestnuts in the chestnut um, husks is what they're called, I'm not sure. So they could grow up to about 200 feet tall and sometimes as big as 12 feet in diameter. So these huge trees, you can see they were called the redwoods of the east. Excuse me for interrupting, Re Rebecca, but could you get everybody to mute? Because there's a lot oh, of extraneous yeah. noises. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for bringing that to my attention. I wasn't sure where that was coming from. So yeah, if everybody could keep muted, if you're not speaking, please. So the Redwoods of the East, and in this map, it shows the original range of the American chestnut. They grew all the way from up north in Maine, all the way south to Mississippi. And so they're important to people through all of that range. And they had white flowers in the spring that would make the hillsides in the spring look like they were covered in snow, but it wasn't snow, it was chestnut flowers. And some people call them the cradle to grave tree because the wood was used for so many different things that were used for everyday life, from cradles to caskets and everything in between. And some things that were made out of chestnut are still in use today. And so they grew so many nuts that people would go to gather them and farmers would feed the nuts to the livestock and Native American cultures would ground the nuts up to make flour, to make food out of that. And so they were really a keystone species of the forest. And a keystone species is one of those species that kind of helps to keep everything else together in the ecosystem. So from the chestnut that helped out people, people could eat the chestnuts, the deer and the bears and the turkeys eat the chestnuts, and then the mountain lions eat the animals that eat the chestnuts, and the blue jays and birds, and uh, they're also really important for pollinators. Um, also, I believe they were also important for the passenger pigeon, which used to have millions and millions, I think billions of passenger pigeons, but it's extinct now. But unfortunately, in the early 1900s, the chestnut blight arrived in North America, which is native to Asia. But so the Chinese chestnut trees are resistant to it, but the American chestnut trees were not. And it was the first detected in the Bronx Zoo. A lot of invasive species that come to the US first arrive or are first detected in New York City because so many things come through there. And so the chestnut blight made it impossible for um, the chestnuts to survive. <clears throat> but 
technically, um, so, sorry, a little brain fart there. Um, the thing about the chestnut blight is that it only affects a chestnut once it's grown a certain amount. <clears throat> so it will kill the chestnut trees. They can keep regrowing from their roots and sprout back up. But after they're a couple years old, then they'll get infected and they'll die again. So today there are still some chestnut trees in the forest, but they can only survive as really small trees or kind of shrubs. So not the same role in the ecosystem that they once had. <clears throat> and this is a poster. Um, they wanted people to look for American chestnut trees. They are offering a $200 reward for the largest tree found. Um, and so in 2016, I'm not sure if any larger ones have been found since then, but the largest one they found was 18 inches diameter, DBH is diameter at breast height. That's what is usually used to measure trees. So from 12 feet to the largest being only 18 inches. So there are still some out there, but they're much smaller now. <coughs> the good news is there is um, hi, can everyone please mute if you're not speaking, please? Thank you. Okay, so the American Chestnut Foundation has been working really hard to help restore the American chestnut tree and the, um, what is, the American Chestnut Research and Restoration Project at the SUNY College of Environmental Science and Forestry, which is where I went to college. And so first they tried um, breeding a hybrid of the American chestnut and the Chinese chestnut. So this is the American chestnut leaf on the light, right, left and the Chinese chestnut tree on the right. And so when they do a hybrid, because the Chinese chestnut is resistant, then the resistant gene can be in the hybrid species. But the thing is that lots of all of the genes are mixed up. So when you get the hybrid tree, it's about 60% to 90% American chestnut. It's not really fully the American chestnut anymore. And you don't really know how that's gonna affect the forests. So they, my professor from my college helped to develop a program to um, use um, I'm sorry, you guys. I'm really tired today. So they, they started a program to try to develop a transgenic chestnut that would just have the one gene for resistance to the chestnut plate, but would still be 100% American chestnut aside from that. So they found that um, oxalate oxidase, which is found in grains and crops and a lot of plants in the wild and has been studied for a really long time, that chestnut trees that have that would be resistant to the blight. So they were able to use um, genetic engineering to develop a blight resistant American chestnut tree. And the way that my professor describes it is that if you had this huge book that was all of the DNA in the chestnut, it would be like um, if you just added one phrase into the book. And besides that, the book was not changed at all. Whereas the hybrid species would be like if you took out, you know, 60% of, or like 30 to 40% chunk of the book and replaced it with a different book. This is like, it's the same book, but you're just putting in one more phrase. And so that's how they developed what is called the Darling 58 American chestnut, which is resistant to the chestnut blight. And they've done a lot of research to see how this interacts with other species in the environment, um, with the bumblebees and insects and the leaf litter and the mycorrhizal fungi in the soil and all these things. And have pretty much found that it doesn't have any um, negative effects on all these different parts of the ecosystem that it might interact with when it's in the wild.
Now, coincidentally, after I decided to do this workshop, um, I found out that there were some new updates that now I get to share these with you too. So several years ago, they started the 10,000 chestnut challenge, which was their goal to produce the first 10,000 American chestnut trees that of this resistant variety. And so this year, they actually reached that goal in 2022, which is really exciting. So this, these are some students and researchers at ESF gathering the chestnuts from the tree, putting them into these bags um, so that they can be regrown into even more chestnuts. So of course, because they're nuts, every one of these little seeds could become a new chestnut tree. And so they now they have a new goal, which is to see if they can grow 10,000 chestnuts every year. And this was a quote from their report from this year. For meaningful forest ecosystem restoration, we need to go big. The question is, can we ramp up to a million trees per year within the next decade? And then we'd be able to put them back into the forest and to places where people would like to plant them. So they started with this chestnut restoration demonstration forest where they started growing the chestnut trees, then harvesting the nuts from there and getting even more chestnuts. So if you would like to help with the chestnuts coming back, there is one thing that you can do right now, but I'm gonna come back to that in a little bit. So for right now, oh, and this is a picture of my nature, from my, my nature journal earlier this year of, um, I was actually at a town meeting and someone had in a pot a very small American chestnut. And so that's um, my emotional reaction to seeing the chestnut in real life. I was just like, wow, it's a chestnut tree, it's a little baby one. Um, now that I think of it, I don't really know if it was one of the resistant ones or not or where they got it, but that's just how it made me feel. So I want to invite all of you to think about what is it that you would see in your ecosystem that would make you feel that emotion. So that's my dream, it's my hope that in maybe in a few decades, people in the future, if they roast chestnuts for Christmas, they can be American chestnuts. So think about what is it that you wish or that you dream for the place where you live? And I don't mean like sleeping at night dreams, but the kind of dreams that's what is it that you want? If you were, um, you know, if you celebrate Christmas, if you are going to have a, look, what would you ask? Santa for, for what would be your wish for nature? And so someone last week told me about this book called From What Is to What If. That's all about how it's important it is to have, use our imagination and that will help us to create the future that we want to see. And so it starts at the beginning, he puts this quote from Neil Gaiman, who is a really famous um, fiction author. And he wrote, we all, adults and children, have an obligation to daydream. We have an obligation to imagine. It is easy to pretend that nobody can change anything, that we are in a world in which society is huge and the individual is less than nothing, an atom in a wall, a grain of rice in a rice field. But the truth is individuals change their world over and over. Individuals make the future and they do it by imagining that things can be different. And another quote that I wanted to share, I'm reading this book called Rest is Resistance. And I think that is another thing that is a great reminder on this winter solstice, the shortest day of the year for us in the Northern hemisphere, the longest night. I think these things of imagination and dreaming and resting are really important to remember. And so this quote says, when we honor our bodies via rest, we are connecting to the deepest parts of ourselves. We are freedom making. What stories are we holding deep inside that are untold and uncovered because we are too exhausted? So 
to be able to change the world around us, we need to change the stories that we're telling to each other. We need to be able to imagine the future that we want to see. And to do that, we need to rest and we need to daydream. So again, these are the questions that I would like to pose to all of us today. You can think about what do I dream? What's my wish for my ecosystem, for the land that I call home? Um, a lot of workshops here, I like to share um, doing a stream of consciousness technique. In a lot of these workshops, I say, write whatever comes into your head, you know, write the whole time, let your thoughts become clear to you through the process of writing. And so today you can do that if you want to, but I'd like to invite you to take a little bit of a different approach. So I invite you to daydream, maybe stare out the window, put on some quiet music if you want to. Um, you can close your eyes or put down your head for a minute, just get comfortable, get cozy, whatever that means to you let your mind wander, just like if you were going for a wander out in nature somewhere, exploring and seeing where you end up and what are you gonna find that you wanna put in your nature journal? It might be someplace unexpected. So think about what, think about that kind of feeling like when we were a kid and watching the clouds and that feeling that anything is possible. So when I ask what, um, what do you dream? What's your wish? It could be related to the American chessman, but it could be about something else too. So I'm going to put on a timer for about 20 minutes. And so just relax, do any of those things, whatever feels right to you. And then just have your paper ready. When a thought does come up, you can jot it down. So don't feel like you have to be writing the whole time unless you want to. And of course, don't worry about grammar or spelling. Right now, it's just about the ideas, the thoughts, the images or emotions that come to mind for you. So, and then we'll have time to share for anybody who wants to share. And I will tell you about the one thing that you can do to help the chestnut right now. So any questions? Okay, I'm gonna put a timer on for 20 minutes and then we'll come back together. And if you're watching the recording, do this live along with us with the video. So 20 minutes starting now.
minutes left.
four more minutes. One minute left. Okay, that's the end of the time. So if you're writing, finish up writing your thoughts. If you're not writing, maybe you just take a deep breath or two to, you know, bring your mind back to being together as a group. So how did that go for everyone? something a little bit different from what we normally do here, but it felt it seemed like the right thing for us to do this time of year. So before we share, can everyone still see the presentation? So I wanna tell you about the thing I told you about of something you can do to help the chestnut. 
So hang on, let me adjust all these video squares again. So after I decided to do this workshop, again, I coincidentally found out that um, we're actually in the middle of a public comment period for supporting whether or not the chestnut should be allowed to um, be planted. So because it is a transgenic organism, um, that means that the FDA and the EPA need to approve it. And so this is hopefully predicted to happen by August 2023, or maybe even earlier in next spring or summer. And so if it gets approved, then the trees will be able to be distributed um, for both big landscape scale restoration and for civilian use. Um, so people could have a chestnut in their yard or things like that. And so there's, there's actually one final public comment period before they make their decision. And the, so they say, um, this is from the Chestnut Project from ESF. They say, we hope that everyone reading this update will participate by sending in positive comments that you want these trees for your own use, as well as for restoring the forest ecosystems. And so that um, the deadline for that is actually on December 27th. So if you're interested in doing that, we're just in time. And so, um, of course, you can write your comment whichever way you want, in favor of it or against it. I personally am in favor of it. I don't want to tell you what you should think, but if you want to help make this a reality, then I've got some resources here that you can check out. The first two are the most important. I didn't have time in this workshop to go deeper into the science or onto how to write a public comment. Um, and of course, this is a busy week with the holidays, but if you even have 10 minutes to write a couple sentences or a paragraph and submit a comment online, it doesn't need to be perfect. Um, and so you can talk about the science and those things if you won't learn about it, but it might be even, um, you could also write about your dreams. What would it mean to you to have the chestnut trees restored to the forest? So I'm gonna put those resources into the chat. For anyone who wants to do more with that after we leave here today. And then, is there anyone who would like to share about some of the things that you wrote or that you thought about during these past 20 minutes? Okay, um, it's not pasting. There we go. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I taught a workshop two years ago when they had a, one of their earlier public comment periods where I did go a little more in depth into the science and the how to write a public comment. So I've also, one of the links I just shared in the chat include my slideshow from that and one of the public comments that I previously submitted, just to give you one example. But for now, is there anyone who would like to share? So some of the things that came up for me, um, I was thinking about, you know, what do I dream? What's my wish? I asked myself, can I fully imagine it? What would it be like to be there with all my senses? So I was thinking about the American chestnut and I thought about, um, I imagined being a person in the future, walking through the forest, coming to my favorite sit spot on the roots of an old growth American chestnut tree that was planted during the great chestnut restoration back in the 2020s. And I imagined seeing all of the branches high above me and the light coming through the leaves. And I am... I wondered what the bark of a mature chestnut tree feels like and what it's like to rest under the shade of the chestnut tree. And I imagined the excitement of the yearly event to go gather the chestnuts. And I wonder if maybe people will go chestnut picking with their family, like the way that we go apple picking. 
of course, you have to watch out for the spikes. <clears throat> so those were a few of the things that came up for me. And would anybody else, if you'd like to raise your hand, or click on the raise hand button if you'd like to share. Um, and if you'd rather not be on the recording, just let me know and I'll pause the share before. Um, can I do that? I don't think I can do that actually. No, I can't. I can pause the recording if you want me to. So just let me know. Do you mind going back to the screen where we can see everybody? Oh, please? Um, you can click on gallery view uh, to see everybody. Is, 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 that all, is everybody good? Great. Okay. Ashi? Hi. <clears throat> um, my imaginings took me down to the seashore. And uh, I imagined plastic free beaches everywhere. Birds wheeling and circling, crying out happily for the abundant food. So few humans that there's food for everyone. I smell the salt, the seaweed, the guano. I feel the gritty sand between my toes. The ocean breathes and pulses with life. It is life, the source of all. The breeze is cold and sharp and it makes me feel alive and vital. An octopus inches in the shallows, suddenly vanishing as my shadow covers it. Not a scrap of plastic to be seen anywhere, and none unseen either, for we've solved the problem of microplastics in the ocean. As I sit against the dune, protected from the wind, a pelican approaches me to say hi. We check each other out eye to eye. I'm going to cry. <laughs> And know we both belong here. I take the deepest breath I've taken all day and exhale with gratitude. Thank you, Ashi. <clears throat> Leslie, would you like to share? Well, I didn't write this, but this is what That's I okay. thought. Um, so I live in, in the Southwest. I live in Santa Fe. And I just recently moved into a new home that they took and scraped the ground completely free of everything to put the house on it. And so <clears throat> my husband and I just finished putting in 16 trees. And we have another four trees that we're planning on putting in um, a little bit later when they become available. And I found myself wondering, you know, I, I saw the, the uh, map of where chestnuts grow. And I just kind of wondered if chestnuts would grow here. Um, you know, they may need more uh, humidity or moisture, I don't know. But um, I'm like, oh, I, I really love trees. I have this thing about trees. And <clears throat> what I want is not a garden, but I want a forest. <laughs> even though I have a very small yard. And I was just wondering, I don't know, uh, will a chestnut grow if I can give it what it needs uh, here in the Southwest? So I, I'll be investigating that to find out. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure, but maybe I'm sure you can find out. It's a great dream. When I, in my college, there's, it's in the, in, the city in Syracuse, right next to Syracuse University, where I, where I went, and there is this little patch of ground that the dendrology teacher planted, I think, like ten or twenty years ago, to see could you make like a small patch of forest even in the city. So there are these like youngish trees, but the leaf mm -hmm. litter goes down, and um, understory plants. So it's kind of forest like. So you might be able to do something like that, even if you have a small area of ground around mm -hmm. your house. Mm -hmm. So 
Thank you, Leslie. They say um, from the gardeners that I've talked to here that the first thing you do is take care of your trees before you ever think about putting a garden in, you need to take care of your trees, um, mm -hmm. put them in and then and then it will it will change the soil, it will change everything and make it more amenable to growing other things. So thanks. Start with the trees. Would anyone else like to share? Yvette? I think my dream might be weird, but I'll go for it. There's, my, there's no weird, there's no right or wrong answer here. Whatever it is, is your dream. My dream is that when you turn on the news, we're regularly talking about the battle to rescue our endangered species. Wherever mm -hmm. we are, we talk about the local ones. Maybe we share national victories, whatever country we're in. Um, where maybe I'll we'll be here in the Bay Area and we'll talk about the about the Dune Gilia and we'll be talking about restoration efforts being underway and how to get involved. And then we'll say in other news, across the coast, we'd heard of the American chestnut as being a dead dream, but it has become back to life. And we talk about how the American chestnut is now flourishing again in the forests. And so we say, let's cheer on our fellow East Coast, um, East Coast restorationists, that kind of thing. Um, or maybe we talk about a new endangered species discovered in the Southwest and what it will take to protect it. So this becomes news that we talk about regularly as a society and that we become aware of with regular pathways to getting involved so that people don't think of it as being something that the young and ideal do, but it's something that anybody can and should be doing. Um, to the point where it becomes a matter of national responsibility, wherever we are and whatever species, whatever endangered ecosystems um, are, um, are at, and that the conversation goes beyond endangered species to endangered ecosystems. I love that. <clears throat> that's an amazing dream. And I, that's something that would help everybody else's dreams too. <clears throat> anybody else we're at one o'clock but i'm happy to stay longer for anybody else who wants to share susan um, I didn't I didn't write particularly, but I was but I was thinking about this and um uh I actually got to sp actually like sp spotted and identified some American chestnuts in the wild for the first time this year and um yeah they look they look so different than the pictures that you're showing of these amazing trees and you know I think they're 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 lighted and you know just looking at that um that was it was like really exciting to me i think they had the kind of same reaction you had um seeing seeing that it, it just like actually recognizing it because it has very distinctive leaves and you, even even without the huge tree you can you can tell what it is and it's just amazing but i was thinking with that and i'm just you know i mean you you know my my dream is is for the uh of the future is is walking through the Albany pine bush and just mm -hmm. just clouds and clouds and we have this this little these little carner blue butterflies they're very very tiny but and they used to be abundant and there are stories of what people walking through in that that sort of window of time in May when they come out and just clouds of them coming up from from everywhere you go and, and I and I, I hope we get to that point I know and Rebecca I know you had the job of counting the carner blues and I, I hope I, I, I dream of being at the point where nobody could possibly count them, where where you where you you can't go and you can't count them. You you all you can do is say, well, you know, this is like the air is a hundred percent full of them. Here, the air is ninety percent full, and you can only do that because it's just impossible. Um, and all the other bugs and all the other cool, you know, in, 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 interesting things that, that grow there. I just you know, I always like to like to think about our you know to to jump on what what Ivea was saying. People of people valuing 
our ecosystems and our species as much as they value the other things that they value. So that, that is in, you know, that that's what's in the news and everything. And thinking about sort of the, 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 the scrappier looking ecosystems like the Albany pine bush, where it doesn't look like this grand forest. In fact, they're, they're, they're taking some of the hardwood forests down that are in that area to restore that habitat. Which is sort of alarming, but it's but it's it's bringing back this unique ecosystem, and I hope that that people recognize and 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 value those kinds of places and and for what amazing wonders they can provide too. Um, oh, um, and Karen's asking, or uh, Jasmine's asking, what what was the name of the butterfly? It was the Carner Blue Butterfly, um, which is uh, so um, then. If, uh, if we if we get back to 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 the clouds of corn blue butterflies, I will I will uh, I'll think of you in the the, the Xerxes blue and and that in some way that's kind of maybe help they'll helping to ease the sting a little of the loss of the Xerxes blue. But that's what I hope for. I think I'm tearing up a little bit again. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Susan. Yvette? Just wanted to say that that gives me a bit of a shiver to imagining the Carner blue because naturally I'm going to think of the Mission blue, which is a cousin or it's a, um, not really a cousin. I think that's the Ackman blue that's a cousin of the extinct Xerxes, but there's a bunch of blue butterflies out there that are slowly dying. The Xerxes was a butterfly that lived here in San Francisco um, up until the 1940s when it was last seen. And it's the first butterfly um, on record going extinct because of human activities in North America. Um, a few months back for the first time ever at the Academy of Sciences, they brought out a couple of their Xerxes and put them on display. And just looking at them and seeing the past right there, this butterfly that we've tried so hard to protect the ecosystem of because we know that this one butterfly will never come back unless they do genetic engineering on it. And it's like, it gives you a shiver when you see an extinct species on display in a museum. I hope that the, I hope that the chestnut is not one of those someday. I hope that we get to see the chestnut in the wild again. I think maybe it's a bit morbid, but when I think about the species I want to protect, from now on, I'm going to think about the feeling I got seeing the Xerxes in its mm -hmm. display case and the way that it would hurt to see other species that we love going the same way where we could only ever see them in the display case with glass separating us. Thank you for sharing that, yeah. No, don't be sorry, Vea. I think everything that you just said is really, really powerful. There's no pressure. Or does anybody else who hasn't shared yet want to share something? I, I just had a, yeah, yeah I, I just had a question actually about the chestnuts. Um, I was curious about the Chinese chestnut tree and because it is so resilient, um, I'm curious like are there are there a lot of Chinese chestnut trees that you can see on the East Coast um, in people's yards or just kind of um, naturalized? That's a good question. I don't think so. I don't think it's been intentionally planted or planted in the wild, but it's um, more the idea that like, oh, they live over there and they're resistant. So maybe we can, um, there are some, I'm sure there are some planted in the research forests and the arboretums so that that must be how they were able to do the hybrids um, and then have the baby, I say baby, but you know, seedling and then growing the hybrids of American and Chinese chestnut. But I don't think they're really grown much outside of that. I could be wrong, but not to my knowledge. 
I don't uh, know if chestnuts. Then, yeah, I'm just saying oh, comment. I don't know if chestnuts would be planted intentionally as street trees because they have all the chestnuts that fall down and all the spiky um, cases around the nuts. So I don't imagine those would intentionally be used as street trees because they probably make a mess. But I don't. I don't really know. Uh, that's a good question, Jasmine. I was also curious if if people have reported a difference in the taste in the Chinese chestnut versus the American chestnut. Um, I don't know where you would find that, like maybe historical accounts or just people that have happened to try both of them. That's and, a good question too. And I don't know. Susan, do you have any idea? I I don't know. I've only I, I've I've eaten roasted chestnuts from the grocery store and from like street vendors in New York City who, who make the best roasted chestnuts. And, and I don't know which kind they were. That's all I've ever had, but they're very delicious. I, but I suspect they were European chestnuts. I just recently watched a video um, uh, that was talking about uh, the sort of chestnuts roasting on open fire and was, and, and was saying that the European chestnut, like the American chestnut, has just one big, like not inside the, the shell, but the Chinese chestnut often has several, and so they might mm. be several smaller ones. And so I'm wondering, I, I, I don't, that's all I have to go on. And I, I'm suspecting therefore that the chestnuts that, that I have encountered that eaten and eaten have been European chestnuts because they only had the one, the one big um, nut in there. Um, but I'm not, that, that's, that's sort of going on third hand. <laughs> I wouldn't put a whole lot of stock in that, but that might be, that might be an indication that we eat more European chestnuts if we do eat them. Um, but if you don't, you should definitely, if you can find them at the grocery store, you should you should get some and roast them because they are delicious. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, so I, I'm not, I'm, I, I, I don't know beyond that, just that the Chinese chestnut possibly has like more smaller bits inside, I'm not sure. Yeah, great question. Um, and that makes me also wonder, is there a difference in the fat content with other nutrients between the American and the European? I guess, there, it, would the American chestnut nuts be also be healthier for the wildlife here? I don't know. But I know that there's a, a like having the nuts with all the fat and the calories and the protein really helps the animals to survive the winter. Um, so... Um, before anybody has to leave, I just want to put, um, so here's in the chat again, if you'd like to send a donation over to me, help me pay the rent, or if you want to donate to the chestnut restoration efforts, again, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for playing along with our activities today and using your imaginations, and thanks for sharing, and thanks for being so vulnerable and um the I don't know, the the way that our community here is strengthened by all of us sharing these dreams and thoughts and things that we imagine so thank you for being here um and if you want to stay more and keep chatting or if you want to share anything more i'll stay around for a few more minutes uh, if not, have a great day and happy holidays, happy Hanukkah, Merry Christmas, happy Kwanzaa, all of that, happy winter solstice. I hope you get a chance to see the sunset tonight and have a good rest on the longest night. Thank you, Rebecca. Thank you, Jasmine. Enjoy the rest of your solstice day. You and too. Everyone. I was inspired you, by you, Jasmine. I got oh. up to look at, I went outside to look at the sunrise this morning. And it's actually a super sunny day here, which is always nice. So 
Uh, hopefully we'll get to see the the sunset or the twilight later too and just get really get that feeling of like experiencing the length of the day today so thank you for your idea jasmine oh you're welcome and i i loved how you talked about the nautical and the astronomical twilight because i looked it up and i was like wow the astronomical one starts like at 5 45 i guess the sky starts getting a little bit lighter so early uh, i did not see that part i was looking at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah it's interesting you think of it's day and it's night but there's actually an each morning and each evening there's about a two hour window where it's in the in between yeah like even when it's light out and we think it's the sunrise the sun hasn't risen yet it's not sunrise yet so, yeah it's interesting to start there's, to a, there's a whole bunch of atmosphere to light up before the sun actually appears above the horizon yeah the sun the sun all of the stuff about like the astronomical and nautical and everything makes me think about um have you all seen the film adaptations of the hobbit uh like the new one um yeah, yeah. I, I saw the first the first one i i yeah we, we need to watch the rest of them but it, i just it? it just reminds me of the really awesome cryptic clue with the with the hidden door the way yes. that the last light of Durin's day wasn't sunlight, it was moonlight. It just made me, I don't know, that kind of stuff just makes me happy when <laughs> when the, or like trying to figure out, there was this one time back in 2007 where there was an eclipse, but we didn't know exactly, like everybody assumed that the eclipse would be sometime during the middle of the night and nobody figured out, myself included, that it was actually at sunset that the moon was rising red that night and that by the time the moon got to be too high up in the sky the eclipse would already have been over and oh, so wow. nobody remembered nobody realized that we had to go watch the moon rise in order to see the eclipse properly and i don't know just i don't know something about astronomy just makes me happy <laughs> <laughs> and i love it when whenever you talk about it jasmine because you always explain it in a way that i'm just like wait what how <laughs> you're the one who taught me the term azimuth recently so it just yeah it's fun stuff. Like that, 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 that fact that that the that the the eclipse was happening at moonrise for you. If you could get in touch with somebody in a different part of the world who would say, "No, the moon is right overhead during the eclipse," then right there you would have proof that the Earth is round. <laughs> Like not, not not that we need it, but it's always nice to have more. You know, that actually reminds me. Oh, sorry. No, you first time. It reminds me of this um, thing when I was in high school. I had a boyfriend, um, and he he was really into astronomy, and he was going to be in France for the summer. And I was like so depressed, you know, that he was going to be gone for like a month or two months or however just so depressed and then to comfort me he was like yeah like there's going to be this full moon and we can both see it like around the same time and so like we planned on going to see that that moon I, I don't know if it was full I actually can't remember the detail but I just thought it was so romantic <laughs> at the time <laughs> I'm trying to think, when the moon hits your sight at the same time of night, that's amore. <laughs> Wait, is that what the actual original song no, is? No, I was making up my own version. There are a lot of funny versions but I, I think, of I think there's, there's, Yeah, there's kind of like an internet sort of meme of like making up new verses to that song. <laughs> because the only place I know that one from is the Good Feathers. <laughs> you all watch Animaniacs as kids? yeah oh that's okay rebecca it's it's this thing about um a bunch of pigeons except that the pigeons are acting like the good fellas so mafia pigeons <laughs> yeah at one point they do um a parody of west side story but it's sung to i want to perch on scorsese's head why can't i perch on scorsese's head? 
like that kind of thing. Because I guess Martin Scorsese is the one who does all of the mafioso movies. I don't know. Sorry. That's great. I'm going to end the recording. So if you're watching the recording, thank you okay. and have a good day.